See, back in 2004, Dubai wasn't the global icon it is today. It was rich, sure, but built on oil, and everyone knew that oil doesn't last forever. The city's rulers were thinking ahead. They wanted something that would outlive the oil wells, a symbol, something the entire world would recognize instantly, even from a photo taken at 30,000 feet. That's when Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum made his move. His plan wasn't just about a tower, it was about rewriting Dubai's image. At the time, nobody believed Dubai could do it. They didn't have the skyline, the climate, or the experience. What they had was ambition and a lot of desert. At first, the project was planned to be 550 meters tall. That alone would have broken records, but you know how this game goes. Once the race starts, nobody wants second place. While Dubai was sketching its tower, architects in China and Saudi Arabia were drafting their own tallest building in the world projects. So Dubai made a call that would change everything. If they were going to build the tallest, they'd build it so tall no one could catch up. They raised the target to 650 meters, then 750, finally 828 meters, almost a kilometer into the air. But here's the twist. The final height was a state secret. Not even the engineers knew exactly how tall they were building. Only a handful of executives at EMAR, the developer, had the real number. Drawings were split into segments so no one could piece it together. It was part security measure, part psychology. The fewer questions, the faster the work. By 2007, the tower had already surpassed Taipei 101 and it wasn't even done. By 2008, it was taller than any radio mast or structure ever made by humans. The Burj had officially become the tallest thing on Earth, and it still had floors left to go. Now, let's talk about what that actually means, because it's one thing to dream about a record breaker. It's another thing to build it in a desert where the ground isn't even solid. Unlike New York, which sits on granite, Dubai sits on sand and soft limestone. You can't just drop a skyscraper here and expect it to stand. It's like trying to build a mountain on a sponge. So the engineers came up with a foundation unlike anything before. First, they poured a four meter thick concrete mat, Imagine a giant shoe sole that spreads the tower's weight evenly across the ground. Then they drilled 194 piles, each 50 meters deep and over a meter wide. These piles anchor the building into denser layers of soil and kind of like driving rebar into jelly until it hits something firmer. Together those piles and that mat carry 450,000 tons and they keep the entire building from sinking, even a few millimeters. And then there's the heat. People forget that this is a place where metal burns to the touch, where asphalt melts, and where the ground temperature can hit 60 degrees C. You can't pour concrete in that. It sets too fast and cracks before it even dries. So the team flipped the script. They poured concrete only at night. And to keep it cool, they mixed ice flakes directly into the blend. That innovation set a record of its own. They managed to pump concrete to a height of 601 meters, something that had never been done before. At its peak, there were over 12,000 workers on site from more than 100 countries. If you've ever been near a live construction zone in 40 degrees heat, you know it's brutal. Now imagine doing that at 700 meters, with wind cutting through scaffolding and sand blowing through your mask. In 2006, there was even a riot. Thousands of laborers overwhelmed by exhaustion and poor conditions. But by the next morning, most were back at work. That's how unforgiving this project was. There were no restarts, no pauses, only progress. In total, it took 22 million man hours to build. That's the kind of number that barely makes sense. If one person tried to do it alone, it would take over 2,000 years. Now here's something you probably didn't know. The Burj Khalifa wasn't always called that. It was originally the Burj Dubai. But when the 2008 financial crisis hit, Dubai was in deep trouble. The project nearly collapsed under its own cost. That's when the ruler of Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed al Nahyan, stepped in with a massive bailout. As a thank you, the tower was renamed Burj Khalifa, Khalifa Tower, a gesture of gratitude and a reminder that even the tallest tower on earth needed a little help to stand. All right, let's talk about the design. Because this isn't just a tall building, it's a masterpiece of aerodynamics disguised as art. The lead architect, Adrian Smith, didn't just want it to look beautiful, it had to outsmart the wind. Early models of tall towers kept failing because of something called vortex shedding. When wind hits a building evenly on both sides, it creates a rhythmic push and pull that can make the whole structure sway. To fix that, Smith used a genius trick. The Burj Khalifa's footprint isn't a square or a circle. It's based on the desert flower Himena Callis, with three petals spiraling from a central core. As the tower rises, each wing steps back slightly, creating a twisting shape that confuses the wind. The result? 
The air never hits the same pattern twice, so it can't build up dangerous oscillations. It's architecture meeting nature, form serving function in the most poetic way possible. And then there's the skin of the tower, 24,000 glass panels, each custom cut and coated with layers of silver and titanium to reflect the desert sun. It reduces solar heat by about 70%, which sounds impressive, until you realize the building still needs 10,000 tons of cooling every summer. That's the equivalent of melting two icebergs just to keep the air inside comfortable. You think about that and realize the Burj Khalifa isn't just a building, it's an ecosystem, and it doesn't waste much either. The air conditioners collect condensation, the moisture from the humid desert air, and reuse it. Over a year, they capture around 57 million liters of water, enough to fill 20 Olympic swimming pools. That water is then used to irrigate the surrounding park and feed the iconic fountain at its base. Speaking of that fountain, it's a show all on its own. Designed by the same team behind the Bellagio Fountain in Las Vegas, it shoots jets of water 150 meters into the air, perfectly synchronized to lights and music. It costs $218 million and it turns the base of the tower into a nightly performance, one that draws more tourists than any other spot in the city. That's the thing about the Burj Khalifa. Everything about it is extreme. Even the elevators are world records. The tower runs 57 elevators, some double-decked, that travel at 10 meters per second, roughly 35 kilometers per hour. That's about 2.5 floors per second. Imagine pressing level 124 and getting there before your brain finishes processing the number. But there's a hidden system behind all that speed, sky lobbies. At certain floors, passengers transfer between elevators just like subway lines to reduce crowding and power use. It's an elegant solution to a massive logistical problem. And still, with all that tech, safety came first. The Burj has 10 fireproof elevators, sealed and pressurized so smoke can't get in. Every 30 to 40 floors, there are refuge zones, reinforced areas where up to 500 people can wait safely during an emergency. Even the stairwells are overbuilt, protected with fire-resistant concrete thicker than what most skyscrapers use on their outer walls. This isn't just luxury architecture, it's disaster-proof design. And that's what most people never realize. The higher you build, the more problems you invent. Every extra meter means more wind load, more sway, more pressure, more heat. You don't just scale a normal building up to a kilometer. You have to reinvent everything. Foundations, materials, elevators, plumbing, even cleaning systems. Let's talk about that for a second. Cleaning this monster? It's a never-ending job. The Burge's 24,000 glass panels cover more than 17 football fields of surface area. A team of over 30 professional climbers spends three months just to clean every window. And by the time they finish, they start again. It's a full-time cycle. Some areas are so high or oddly angled that robots take over, custom-built rigs that crawl the spire like mechanical spiders. Even then, sandstorms coat everything again within days. In Dubai, dust isn't just dirt, it's part of life. And while we're busting myths, let's address one of the biggest. No, the Burj Khalifa doesn't rely on trucks to carry away sewage every day. That rumor started from older systems in nearby buildings. The Burj is fully connected to Dubai's municipal infrastructure. It's not glamorous, but yes, it flushes like a normal building. Now, living or working inside the Burj isn't exactly what most people imagine. It's not one giant open tower. It's divided into zones, luxury apartments, offices, hotels, lounges, and even a few restaurants. The Armani Hotel occupies the lower levels, personally designed by Giorgio Armani himself, down to the furniture and scent. Higher up, there are nearly 1,000 private residences, each costing millions. At the very top floors, the air is noticeably cooler, sometimes by 6 to 8 degrees compared to the base. From the 148th floor observation deck, you can literally watch the curvature of the Earth. And here's a cool detail. If you watch the sunset at the base, then race to the top, you'll catch it again a few minutes later. Two sunsets in one evening. It's one of those rare experiences that remind you you're standing on the edge of what's humanly possible. Still, this skyscraper isn't just a luxury symbol. It's a physics experiment turned into architecture. Take wind, for example. Most people think of wind as something you feel on your skin. But when you're 700 meters up, it's an invisible force that can literally move steel. If the design hadn't handled it perfectly, the sway at the top could have been several meters in each direction, enough to make residents nauseous or crack walls. But the twisting design of the Burj Khalifa, those offset wings and step sections, disrupts the airflow so efficiently that the sway is less than half a meter. That's barely noticeable. And speaking of wind, that's what made one of the tower's most famous stunts so jaw-dropping. In 2014, Emirates Airline filmed a commercial featuring a flight attendant standing at the very tip of the Burj, 830 meters high, no green screen, no CGI. She was flown up by helicopter, strapped into a hidden harness, and stood calmly above the clouds as a real jet passed behind her. For a few seconds, you couldn't tell what was crazier. The idea that she was actually 
up there or that a human being had built something tall enough for that to even be possible. The tower has become Dubai's stage to show the world what bigger really looks like. The LED display system alone is a marvel, over a million diodes built into the tower's skin, turning it into a massive vertical screen. From miles away, you can see patterns, flags, even New Year countdowns lighting up 160 stories of glass. Yet from the inside, it stays transparent. That's one of those engineering flexes that doesn't get enough credit. How do you make a skyscraper into a screen without blocking its views? Dubai found the answer. But let's pull back for a second, because behind all the glamour, what this tower really represents is a moment in time, a message carved into the skyline. When construction started, the Middle East wasn't known for record-setting architecture. The world's attention was on New York, Shanghai, Hong Kong, but Dubai decided to bet on the unbelievable. It said, we can do it too, and we'll do it higher, faster, and flashier. 